Honorable Justice Jilani, um, honorable fellow judges of the high courts, ladies and gentlemen, a very good afternoon to all of you. I am grateful to the SECP for organizing this session and inviting me as a speaker. I'm conscious that we are perhaps running short of time, but uh, I'm otherwise daunted to be here because as the last speaker, I have, have to follow in the footsteps of so many distinguished panelists who have preceded me and uh, you know, shared their very insightful thoughts. But uh, I'd like you to bear with me as I try to unravel a principle that has been likened by at least one eminent jurist to be an awful bit of Japanese knotweed that continues to grow and spread its tentacles through the lawn, that being the principle of reflective loss, which is sometimes misunderstood and sometimes overstated. But before we embark on that, let us start with a somewhat more basic principle, which actually uh, you know, sets the, the, the tone. Um, you're all familiar that in company law, the principle of independent legal personality, of course, stands well settled since the House of Lords decision in Solomon and Solomon. That being said, let us consider a situation in which two persons, one of whom is a company, suffer loss as the result of wrongful conduct of a third party. Generally, in law, either of the aggrieved persons may maintain a claim for compensation. The fact that one of the aggrieved is a company and the loss suffered by the other is said to be consequential to that of the company is normally not relevant. There is, however, one very notable exception in the realm of company law, which has been laid down by the Court of Appeal in the case of Prudential Assurance versus Newman Industries Limited. In that case, the claimant had brought a personal claim as a shareholder for loss said to have been suffered due to the directors breaching their fiduciary duties and defrauding the company. It was alleged that such acts resulted in a diminution in the value of the company and the value of the claimant's shares. The court held in that particular context that a shareholder could not bring such a claim which is merely the result of loss suffered by the company in consequence of a wrong done to it by a defendant. It was observed that what a shareholder cannot do is to recover damages merely because the company in which he is interested has suffered damage. He cannot recover a sum equal to the diminution in the market value of his shares or equal to the likely diminution in dividend because such a loss is merely a reflection of the loss suffered by the company. The shareholder does not suffer any personal loss. His only loss is through the company in the diminution in the value of the net assets of the company in which he has a shareholding. The basis of that ruling is that a shareholder's loss in such cases is merely reflective of that suffered by the company. The shareholder does not suffer a loss recognized in law as having an existence distinct from that of the company. Applying the proper plaintiff rule, as had been developed much earlier on by the Court of Chancery in the case of Foss and Harbottle, it was held that when a company is injured as a result of wrongful conduct, any cause of action vests in the company itself. In Newman, the court therefore found that the claimant shareholder could not recover damages on the ground that the company in which he held shares had suffered a loss, as his loss was merely reflective. To understand the principle, one has to keep in mind that a share is not a proportionate part of a company's assets, nor does it confer any legal or equitable interest on the shareholder in such assets. As the court stated in Prudential, a share is merely a right of participation in the company on the terms of the Articles of Association, which confer a number of rights on a shareholder. Those include, for example, a right to vote, on resolutions at general meetings, a right to participate in the distributions that the company makes out of its profits, and a right to share in the surplus assets in the event of a winding up. Coming back to the no reflective loss rule, needless to say, 
if the company's loss does not affect the value of its shares, then there is no sustainable claim available to a shareholder, and the problem that was addressed in Prudential does not arise. A problem only arises where, as in Prudential, a shareholder claims that the company's loss has had a knock-on effect on the value of its shares. What if, in such an instance, the company fails to pursue a right of action, which, in the opinion of a shareholder, ought to be pursued, or compromises its claim for an amount that falls short of its full value? If that opinion is, of course, shared by a majority of shareholders, then they will normally be able to set in course um, a particular action through a resolution passed at a general meeting. Then again, in certain cases, the company acting through its directors may decide not to pursue a claim, perhaps because it arises from a breach of duty owed to the company by those very directors themselves. If the shareholder finds himself in a minority, he still has certain remedies available to him if the decision of the directors or majority shareholders is taken otherwise than in the proper exercise of relevant powers. Such remedies, of course, include a statutory petition against unfairly prejudicial conduct or a winding up on the just and equitable ground if those in control are abusing their powers. Additionally, the common law recognizes the concept of what is termed a derivative action which a shareholder may bring on the company's behalf. Grounds arise for such an action where, most notably, the wrong perpetrated against the company constitutes a fraud against the minority, and the wrongdoers are in control of the company and will not allow it to sue. Under such circumstances, the derivative action thus presents a means by which the minority shareholders can seek redress against the directors, officers, or even third parties implicated in any breach of duty for wrongs committed against the company. The claim is derivative because, again, the cause of action lies with the company and the shareholders merely bring the claim on its behalf. A number of cases that follow Prudential had extended the scope of the reflective loss principle so as to potentially shut out the claims of shareholders who were otherwise seeking recovery in alternate capacities as either a creditor, for example, or as an employee. However, in Marix Financial Limited versus Sevalea, which also happens to be reported in our own uh, SCMR, it's the citation is 2020 SCMR 1867. This is a UK Supreme Court judgment. It was reaffirmed, uh, the UK Supreme Court reaffirmed the orthodox principle barring the recovery of re re reflective loss to the extent that the principle had been laid down in the earlier case of Prudential. The facts of that case were that Mr. Sevalea owned and controlled two BBI companies against whom judgment was made to pay a debt of some five and a half million dollars to a creditor, namely Marix. After the judgment was handed down, but before it was made public, Mr. Sevalea moved assets from the companies, leaving insufficient funds for repayment of the debts. Marek sought damages in tort on two grounds. Firstly, that Mr. Sevalea had induced the violation of its rights under the judgment. And secondly, that he had intentionally caused the companies to suffer loss by unlawful means. Originally, the court's jurisdiction to hear the case was challenged on the ground that the claims were precluded by the no reflective loss principle. In other words, that the proper claimants were the companies and not Marix. Marix was successful at first instance, but then the Court of Appeal uh, held otherwise. The companies had been placed in liquidation and lacked the resources to pursue the claim. And even if the companies had pursued their rights, Marix would have had to claim as a creditor against other creditors, all of whom were actually connected to the alleged wrongdoer. After explaining the relevant principles, the Supreme Court examined the decisions which are said to have established the reflective loss principle, namely the judgment of the Court Appeal of Appeal and Prudential, and the later judgment of the House of Lords in Johnson versus Gore Wood and Company. 
Allowing Marix's appeal, the court clarified that the principle applied only to claims by shareholders, but not to those advanced by creditors. The majority decision concluded that Prudential laid down a rule of company law, which would be subverted if the shareholder could pursue a direct personal action for his own benefit. Per Lord Reed, who authored the majority judgment, the court's understanding of the rule was consistent with the speech of Lord Bingham in Johnson. However, it was observed that Lord Millet's speech in the same case wrongly treated reflective loss as a wider principle of the law of damages based on the avoidance of double recovery. The majority judgment made clear the need to distinguish firstly claims brought by a shareholder in respect of loss which he has suffered in that capacity in the form of a diminution in the share value or in distributions which were the consequence of loss sustained by the company in respect to which the company itself had a cause of action against the same wrongdoer. And secondly, claims brought, whether by a shareholder or by anyone else, in respect of loss which did not fall within that description, but where the company had a right of action in respect of substantially the same loss. The court held that the first kind of case is barred by the rule in Prudential, regardless of whether the company recovers its loss in full whereas the second kind of case is permissible, although it may be necessary to avoid double recovery. In the subcontinent, the essence of a derivative action was captured as far back as the case of Dr. Satya Charan Law versus Rameshwar Prasad Bajoria, and this is reported at AIR 1950. It's a federal court judgment reported at page 133. Uh, several judgments of the High Courts have followed which suggest that the judicial opinion in India appears to favor the maintainability of such an action. In our own jurisdiction, the Sin High Court has, in the case of Sakina Khatun versus SS Nazir Asin, alluded to the possibility of a derivative action as a remedy. Although the matter before the court in that particular case was not a derivative action itself, Justice Muni Bakhtar observed that it is of course true that if a company is in the control of majority shareholders who are abusing their position by, for example, defrauding the company, the minority shareholders can institute legal proceedings to bring such a situation to an end. However, the important point to note is that such an action is a derivative or representative action. The minority shareholders do not act in their right or on their own behalf. The suit is brought on behalf of the company which is unable to take action because of its control by the majority shareholders. The company is, and indeed, must be impleted in such proceedings. Subsequently, the possibility of such an action was also recognized in the case reported as Asif Manan and others versus Suleiman Lalani and others. The plaintiffs in that matter are minority shareholders claiming to hold only 1% in the total number of shares of the company. They claimed to be aggrieved by a substantial payment which the company had made to a third party as an advisory fee and its post facto approval. Since admittedly the quantum of their shareholding was less than what was required to maintain a company petition, a suit was filed under the original civil jurisdiction enjoyed by the Sindh High Court at the principal seat. It was contended that payment of the advisory fee had caused a loss to the company and that as a consequence, the shareholders had suffered loss. It was argued that this suit was maintainable in the form of a derivative action, as the alleged transaction fell within the fraud exception to the rule laid down in Foss and Harbottle, with the directors having acted in breach of their fiduciary duty. The learned single judge, none other than Justice Jagjanel Ghaffar, who happens to be in our midst today, observed that depending upon the facts and circumstances of a particular case, the court could entertain such suits if the plaintiff could satisfy the court that the grievance espoused fell within the scope of a derivative action so as to form an exception to the rule in Foss and Harbottle. Art articulating that principle, Justice Ghaffar opined that the said rule is that where what has been done amounts to fraud and the wrongdoers are themselves in control of the company, it is relaxed in favor of the aggrieved minority who are allowed to bring an action on behalf of themselves and others, 
And the reason for this is that if they were denied their right, their grievance could never reach the court because the wrongdoers themselves, being in control, would not allow the company to come before the court and sue. Whilst observing that case law from the English jurisdiction had persuasive value, his lordship went on to examine the judgment in Foss and Harbottle so as to recognize the possibility of a derivative action being a remedy available in addition to the remedies that were otherwise created in terms of the Companies Act 2017. On that note, uh, turning to our regulatory framework, it is discernible that a number of measures have been introduced through the Companies Act to strengthen the role of the Commission and enhance the authority of the Commission to um, you know, streamline the workings of companies and to make sure, make sure that they are kept on an even keel. Um, most notably, the threshold for filing a petition has also been reduced under Section 286 from 20 to 10 percent. As such, while an aggrieved minority shareholder can bring an action against the company, or in other words, against the adverse decision taken by the controlling shareholders, Recourse nonetheless remains limited to the extent of those who meet that qualifying requirement. What that essentially means is that anybody who has or any group of shareholders who are aggrieved who have a 9.99% share, for example, or less, uh, would remain excluded from availing the statutory remedy. A derivative action, for, on the other hand, is not hindered by that qualifying requirement, but it remains unacknowledged under the Act, despite measures for codification having been taken in other jurisdictions. For example, in the UK, the Law Commission had proposed substituting the common law action with a statutory framework. And uh, you know, this is something which Justice Shahid Kareem had perhaps touched on during the course of his address about how much more extensive the 2006 Act in the UK is. And uh, based on the recommendations of the Law Commission, the common law rule has since been partly codified and displaced in the UK by the Companies Act with sections 260 to 263 setting out the framework of what is now a statutory derivative claim. As a result, the causes of action and variety of petitioners have been expanded. The courts have also been given broad authority and flexibility to assess whether such an action is in the best interests of a company, and if so, whether it should be allowed to proceed. While our courts may, of course, use common law theories on derivative action to maintain them in appropriate cases, reforms on the pattern of the UK could further empower the minority shareholders. My suggestion would therefore be that it may be worthwhile for the Commission to consider whether a codified derivative action framework should be developed. Thank you.